If you're new to ham radio and not so technical like myself, and you really want to get into the HF digital mode, such as PSK31, Contestia, Olivia, FSQ, then you really need to watch this video. In this first part of a series of videos I'll be doing, I'll be covering the Windows setup today. And that's going to include things like knowing where to get your USB drivers that you need to download, how to work within Device Manager, and where are the failure points that most commonly cause problems. Also dealing with external sound cards, I'll be talking about the DigiRig in particular, showing you how to set it up. I'll actually even get into the ICOM 7300 as well as the Yaesu FT891. What are the data settings that you need to put in to make sure that your rig is compatible and operational with any HF digital mode frame? So if this sounds of interest to you, let's get started. Hey, this is MJ, call sign KW3KW, and welcome to another episode of Ham Radio Made Simple. Today, I'm continuing the series on ham radio for prepping, and this is episode number five, and it's actually part two in the digital HF modes. Today, I'm going to be getting into how to set up your Windows platform from A to Z in order for you to be able to operate in the HF digital modes. If you don't get this set up correctly, it's just not going to work. Now, parts three, four, and five, I'll actually get into the specific digital modes, and I'll be going over the, uh, the graphical user interface, the function buttons that are within it, uh, how to use it, and tips and tricks. So today, though, let's focus on the, the, I call it the back end, and get this right. Now, if you're finding value from these type of videos, please hit the like button, the subscribe button. And again, I just want to stop and thank those who have taken the time to give some great comments and encouragement along the way, being able to you know keep this channel going. It's a not-for-profit type of uh, channel. I don't make money off of it. But if you think it's a value and others can benefit from it, by hitting the like and subscribe, it will show up more for others searching for information like this on YouTube. So again, thank you for your support and commitment to helping others find this channel. Now, the agenda is pretty simple. I'm going to go over internal versus external sound cards. Internal, you go path A. External sound card, you have a path B. I'm going to be downloading the USB drivers from both Yesu and ICOM and show you how it's done. We're going to get into Device Manager and show you some hidden features and stuff that is in there that's important because you need to use Device Manager to, one, identify where your ports, your audio ports, and your serial port, your COM ports are, as well as make sure, for example, uh, within those device drivers that the baud rate is set correctly. So I'm going to get through all of that. And by the way, also, for those who have experienced when you open up Device Manager and you don't see the COM port section, I'll show you a little trick on how to make sure that appears. Now, I'm also going to do the rig settings for, for data setup. This is a settings that you have to put in your rig, and I'm doing it for both the IC7300 and the FT891 using the DigiRig uh, sound card. Now, this is so important because I spent hours and hours you know, testing and trying and watching other people's videos. And I'll give you a step-by-step -step list, everything you need to do so you don't have to watch a thousand videos. You'll have it within a few minutes to be able to do this and get it going quickly. And finally, I'm going to do a summary. And in the summary, I'll include some additional information that I did not include in the first part. Now, when we talk about internal sound card, obviously it's internal and it's a simple setup. We're essentially just basically taking the USB port, which you see here, and taking the USB-A Port, and we're going to take that and put that into your, your uh, laptop or PC. Now, you may need a uh, converter if it's a USB-C to a USB-A, but you get the picture. It's simply just putting that into your computer. Nothing hard and too difficult about that. However, don't cheap out. Make sure you have a shielded cable, cable and make sure if, if it doesn't have it, put a ferrite bead on it. And the reason I'm telling you this is this is a failure point. This is where RF noise gets introduced into your system. And you'll never have figured it out because you'll think, oh my gosh, what now is causing my RF noise? This is a prime candidate for it. So don't cheap out, get a good shielded cable. Now we talk about the external sound card and especially on the FT8, FT891, pretty simple. Same thing, take your printer cable, uh, use a USB jack, put it in your port on your uh, uh, computer, no big deal. Now we start to introduce the middleware, and this is from DigiRig. For the FT891, if you order it, they send you two K1 
cables. You only need one. You want the six pin cable because that's going to go in the data jack right in here. That's a six pin on the FT891. If you have a different rig, make sure you know what type of jack the data jack is and what, uh, what cable will work with it because that's critical. The next thing we're, we're going to do is then plug in that cable and take the mic section, the audio, and put it into the audio port on the DigiRig. Now, on the, on the back side of the DigiRig here is a USB port. This is really small. It's really portable, really lightweight. A lot of people like it because they can throw it in a backpack real quick. But essentially, you need one more cable, and that's going to be able to take this US, USB-C to your computer. And you could have a, a, a USB-C or USB-A port there. Whatever it is, again, good cable. Make sure it's good quality. You don't want RF noise. Total cost on this for the Digi Rig, you're probably looking at 80 bucks from the company plus 10 bucks for the printer cable and maybe another seven bucks. So what is that about 97 bucks? Uh, if you use Signal Link, it's like 135 dollars. I'm not sure what cables are uh, come included with it, but again, a little bit bigger. But they have some additional capabilities. Uh, your choice on which one you want to use. I like the portability in the in the small space it takes up within uh, my backpack. Now. Each of your rigs have to be programmed for, with specific data settings. And for the FT891, I've created a, a list, a complete list from A to Z of everything you need to do to get up and running to program your rig. From showing you making sure that you switch to the data mode by doing the long press on the, on the band button. Um, in here where it's yellow, if you want to reset it back to voice from, di uh, from data, here and here are two great settings that you're going to have to come back into. So it makes it quick to know these two settings are required so I don't have to try to uh, work my way through all the functions and try to figure it out. Trying to make it simple, trying to make it easy, even include some of the function buttons and some of the settings on it. Uh, you can stop and pause and look at it, uh, or you can just simply email me at hamradiomadesimple at gmail.com and just say, hey, MJ, I want, I want your setup for either the Yaesu, uh, FT891, or the ICOM, IC7300. Another thing you have to pay a particular attention to is rig filter settings. You got to turn off your filters, noise blanker, notch filter, noise reduction. Now on the ACG, you're going to see some of them are going to recommend uh, the modes are going to say off or slow, but the wing link says fast. So when you do wind, wind link VARA, it is fast. When you're doing your bandwidth filters, typically you want to do wide, especially when you're doing uh, wind link on it. It's important that you set the wide filters. So make sure you know how to do that. Now, <clears throat> on the IC7300 data settings, again, I break it all down, show you the key settings that you have to make sure you put in, everything that you need to know. And again, you can email me, hit the pause, look at this, whatever you need to do on it. But what I want to pull, you know, point out here is make sure you know how to operate the ALC on your rigs, where they are, because you want to keep your ALC at a quarter or less for a lot of these data modes that you're going to be using. So uh, again, know how to set up your rig and know how to use the uh, ALC. Now, make sure it's always set to USB data. And I believe, I, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe all of these data modes use upper sideband and, and D for data. So on the FT891, what you're gonna see when it's programmed right, it should see D for data, U for upper sideband. Here's my ALC at less than a quarter, perfect. On my ICOM, it's the, uh, uh, upper sideband data button right here. You need to see that. Now, just FYI, it's a failure point that happened to me a couple times for some reason. I don't know. Maybe it was one of the setups that I had. But if I'm going from like 20 meters to 40 meters or to 80 meters, um, the upper sideband switched to lower sideband or the, it dropped from data completely. So pay attention because that does happen for some reason at times. Maybe not everyone experiences that. But if it does, you need to go back in and know how to, to change it back to data change this, uh, the sideband back to upper sideband. So again, FYI. Now I'm gonna show you here now how to download the USB drivers. Now, just an observation from my point, I download the FT891 and the ICOM IC7300 since I operate both of those on my computer here. Um, I'm not sure it's really necessary, I did it anyways. It appears when I look at it that they share the same driver. May be the case, may not be the case, but it, it works perfect by downloading both of them. So, you know, make it simple. Um, if you try to go to the Silicon Labs, which is where these are, these are Silicon Lab uh, drivers, part of Windows. 
If you go to the newer version, uh, just FYI, as the time of the recording of this video, when I'm using rig control software, which is FL rig, it was not compatible. And for 24 hours, I pulled my hair out trying to figure out why it wasn't working correctly. I removed the Silicon uh, Labs latest USB driver and went back to the older ones from the manufacturers and it works perfectly again. So again, just a failure point, trying to point out my mistakes. Hopefully you don't make them too. So let's go ahead and jump in to uh, the ASU website and uh, start looking at how we pull down these drivers and making sure everything is right. If you go to the link below in the description, it has the URL for this page. Uh, this is where you're gonna wanna go to get your USB driver download. So once you get here, you have to identify your particular device, your rig, mine's the FT891. I pull that up and that's what it looks like. I need to go over to the file tab over here and just simply go down and look for the virtual COM port driver, which is right here. All I have to do is click that on. I can go into my downloads. And what I'm gonna do is actually identify this and make it the FT891 uh, Windows driver. So I'm gonna go ahead and save this. So now that I know the difference between this file and the ICOM one, because I'm gonna be downloading the ICOM next. Once it's downloaded, go ahead and open up the file. Uh, what you're going to have to do is highlight all. Let me just pull this open all the way. You can see all of this. You need to extract all. So check the box so it checks all of them. Extract all. It's going to go to a C drive location. It's going to extract. Um, next, what we want to do is, again, I'll open this up. Uh, we're going to want to look for the 64.exe. And so this is the installer for the 64-bit Windows driver. So I'm going to go ahead and double-click. And Windows is going to ask me if I can allow it to do it. And I'm going to say, yep, next. I'm going to accept the legal terms, next. And now we can see the Silicon Laboratories and it's ready to use. And I'm going to hit finish. Simple as that. So what we're going to do now is close this out. And we're going to go now over to the ICOM uh, page. And again, the URL is in, the, is in a link in the description below. What you want to do is type in your device. Mine is the IC7300. I hit search. It's going to pull me up. And at the bottom of the page, I can see the 7300 and 7300. The difference is this is a newer version, 218 versus 217. So I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, click this on the hyperlink. It's going to, again, do the legal reading that I have to go through or just say yes. And I just gave away this computer. Uh, next, what we're going to do is uh, download this file. So again, I want to identify it. So I'm going to go IC7300. Now I know this file is associated with my ICOM. Again, I'm going to hit save. And it's going to download. And it is a zip file, so we have to go through the extraction exactly the same way. So I'm going to go ahead and open it. Uh, I'm going to highlight to make sure everything is checked. Extract all. It'll pull up another page. Take it to my C drive, and it's going to show up driver again but this time it's extracted, so it's no longer in a zip file. So if I go ahead and open this up now, let me just hit it twice. I want the Windows 10 version. And again, I want the, dot, uh, the x64.exe installer. So I'm gonna go ahead and double click this. And Windows is gonna ask me, can they have permission to do it? Answer is yes. And again, this wizard's a little bit different. And we're done. Silicon Laboratory is ready to use and hit the finish. So at this point, we easily downloaded both the Yesu and the ICOM drivers. And we're ready now to go to the firmware side and take a look and see uh, what's showing up and point out some important information on that. So let's move over to the device driver side. Now that we have our USB drivers loaded and ready to go. Let's go into Device Manager and see if they're connected and everything's working right. So just right mouse click the Start menu, go up to Device Manager, which you see right in here. And I have my rig on for my IC7300, and let's see what pops up for this, and then I'll do the FT891 after that. So if I go under my sound videos and games, you're going to see the USB audio codec for internal, for most of the internal sound cards, is look for this audio codec. And if I go under my COM port right in here, I see I'm on now uh, COM port seven. What I need to do is right mouse click that and make sure 
that the baud rate is the right setting. So I'm going to go under port settings. Typically, uh, you may see it may start out at uh, 19, or excuse me, 9600 like this, and you may have to change it to your baud rate, which is mine is 19.2. So uh, again, a failure point is going to be right in here. Not it doesn't bother everyone for some reason. Again, there's so many different configurations and additions that you can put into this. But uh, if there is going to be a problem, it's that your baud rate here under your COM port is not matching what's in your software in the rig. They've got to be all the same. So just pay attention to that. And you can always look up your driver information and see which version that you have and what was the date on this. So that's all good. Hit OK. Now we're going to go up to the audio section right up here. And I'm going to make sure that USB codec microphone and USB codec for speakers. Everything looks good. We're pretty much set to go. Now, if you can't see any of this information, like your ports are missing or your audio or some of these things are actually not missing, go up to the view and hit, click on show hidden devices. And this gives you the opportunity to see stuff that's not necessarily uh, visible. So again, um, very simple to use. Just make sure that you use it. And when your rig is on, you can turn the rig on or off and you can see what comp port pops up and that write that information down and you're all set to go. Now, when I pull up my device driver for my Yaesu FT891 using a DigiRig sound card or probably any other third-party sound card, you're going to get a different look. It may not say, you know, the USB codec. So when I pull it up, let's start out here. It's going to show under the sound, video, and game controllers. It's USB PNP, which stands for plug and play sound device. So that's what you would expect to see. So that's good. Now you're going to see actually two COM ports coming up associated when you turn on your rig and these two popped up. Um, so which one do you use? Well, for me, I would say most of the time, <laughs> maybe it's all of the time, but start with the enhanced versus the standard. Th those are, that's the one that always seems to work for me on multiple computers when I uh, load it. So look at the enhanced. So I know right now COM port five is my Yaesu FT91. That's the number I need to put in my software going forward. But again, let's right mouse click Go to properties, let's go under port settings, and see default, it starts out at 9600. So I'm gonna go ahead and put 19.2, which is what I use, again, standard, all my equipment, make it simple. So that looks good. And again, let's pull up the driver information. And you notice it looks pretty much, I think it's the exact same uh, driver, the date and the version, everything that's being used. So that's good, we're good to go. I hit okay, and at this point, I need to go up to my audio and check up here. So if I look under my microphone, it is the USB plug and play. It's showing, so that should work. And under the speaker, uh, also the USB plug and play. Everything checks all the boxes. So at this point, we're good to go and ready to start the software downloads and ready to start putting all this information into the software. So in summary, when I went over the Windows setup, I showed you how to get your USB drivers from the manufacturer, whether it be ICOM or Yesu, and make sure you uh, select the correct ones because that's really critical. I walked you through Device Manager and showed you uh, how to find your audio ports, your COM ports when you add a new device, and particularly to try to find, I call it the uh, baud rate that is hidden on the COM port by, remember, right mouse clicking, going to Properties, remember that, and, and make sure you check that. And always keep your firmware on your all your equipment updated. Now, when we did the internal sound card, it's simple. There's no extra equipment. It's just a single shielded printer cable off the back of the uh, rig right into your computer. When we get into the external sound card, the DigiRig, it's set up for about $80. It's a great system, works really well. I like it, and it's growing in popularity. The Signal Link uh, is, uh, is about $135. Uh, it's a great device. If you can afford it, go for it. Uh, it has some filters and stuff that you can use that are outstanding. Uh, a very low-end one is the Seabrent USB, which you can get on Amazon. Uh, I actually have that. That was my first sound card that I tried. The only downside on it is trying to find data cables that match it today. You have to go to eBay, and there's like maybe one person that carries it, and they don't always have it. So um, it's a great way if you can find everything, but don't count on it being there tomorrow. Under the rig control software, we went over FL rig. It's free, it's pretty robust, it's great, and a lot of people use it, especially when you get into FL rig, FL digi, FL message, FL amp, 
all compatible, all works great. So it's a, a great solid solution. Now, Ham Radio Deluxe offers a great package for about $100. Uh, if you have the extra money, go for it. It's got a lot of robust features and functions. But again, you know, extra cost versus free, you decide. Now, the there is the Omni Rig CAT control, and it is free also. Uh, trouble with trying to use it as rig control software, it doesn't have the functions to be able to control the power, you know, the squelch, the other settings within it like FL Rig does. It's pretty cut down, simple type of product. There is one out there, it's called Hand Lib CAT control. Uh, it is also free, but it takes a lot more technical expertise to get that thing up and running. So, again, just a quick summary. Now, my next three videos are all going to focus on one quality in there. And I'm going to basically try to do a GUI, which is your graphical user interface. I'll go through it and talk about what each of the buttons and everything are. I'll take you through the settings of getting it set up with your either internal or external sound card. And... I'll take you through the uh, operations. So how do you use it? Uh, you know, how do you send a message? How do you send a file, et cetera? And I'll break it into three fi uh, videos uh, covering those areas. One's going to be with the FSQ, Olivia, and Contestia, because they all operate off of uh, FL Digi. Uh, WinLink Vara has its own operating system as well as JSA Call. So those will be the three videos that should come out shortly. Again, I appreciate you for sticking through all of this. So if you like these type of videos and they're really, really helping you or could help others, hit the like button for me and hit the subscribe button as well as continue to put the great comments down. I love hearing from people saying it really, you know, helped them solve a problem. It's helped them be able to learn a lot faster and it makes a lot more sense to them without getting so technical into it. So again, I appreciate all your support, your help. Again, this is MJ, KW3KW with Ham Radio Made Simple, out.